Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson two of my RISC-V assembly programming tutorials. Now, last time we got um, an introduction to RISC-V. This time we're going to go a little bit deeper. We're going to start looking at how to use the stack, and we're also going to have a look at conditions, and we're going to see those in action. So we're going to go straight over to the code. We're going to see it working. Of course, as always, you can go to my website. You can download the source code for today's example, and also the build scripts, including the RAS simulator that we're using to test things on. Over we go. Let's take a look. Now, if like me, you're used to systems like the Z80, the 68000, you might find the content of today is a bit surprising and maybe even a little bit shocking because I found things a bit uncomfortable at this point when I realized that we don't really have any push pop commands at all. I had programmed the ARM before this and that is also described as being a RISC processor, but it's not as reduced as the RISC-V is. So um, I was very surprised by this. Essentially, we don't have push pop commands at all. Um, and we don't even have an addressing mode that can really simulate them directly. Um, when we want to do a push or a pop, we actually have to do two separate commands. We have to manually alter the stack pointer value, um, the subtracting or adding four to it, four being one 32-bit word, uh, which we're going to push or pop. And then we have to store or restore the register that we want to back up or restore um, to that stack pointer address. So our push command is effectively adding minus four to our stack pointer and then storing the register we want to back up onto that stack pointer. You can see the stack pointer in brackets here. And the popping is the opposite. We take the register from the address at the stack pointer and then we add four to the stack pointer. So this is how we do a single register. Now you might think, well, that's not too bad, but things get even worse when we want to store or restore multiple registers on the arm. We had a command that could restore basically every register in one go and also on the 68,000. Well, we don't have that on this system at all. Basically, we can add 32 if we want to back up the equivalent of eight registers, but then we have to st store all eight registers um, to consecutive offsets of that stack pointer or restore them. Yeah, that's really what we have to do. It's, it was quite shocking to me and I was convinced I was being stupid and there must be some other way of doing it, but I, I looked up online and to my knowledge, there's no way of doing it. Now, I don't know if later revisions of RISC-V have added store and load multiple commands. Of course, RISC-V is an open source platform and anyone can add anything they want to it. But by default, I believe there's no other way of doing things. So that's what we're going to have to do. So yeah, that's what we do. Now, I would suggest you create macros to do this for you, certainly if you're going to be doing multiple because you don't want to have to type all that in every time. But even for a single register, it is a lot more convenient to just have a single command that makes it clear what's going on rather than loads of add i's and um, subtractions and loads of LW's and SW's. So there we go. Anyway, today we're going to be sort of going over this. Um, I'm kind of assuming you probably know what a stack is and how they work, but um, we're going to see a practical example of the stack in action here. And we're not going to use the push and pop commands in this example here, just to make it clear what is going on. Okay, um, we are loading in the stack pointer here at the start of this test into A7. That's just for the debugging tools. I've written some little debugging tools to show the contents of the stack. So that's not actually part of today's example. Okay. Let's fire it up and let's take a look. So we've loaded this example here and what we're doing here is we are loading a zero with this test value here. And then what we're doing is we're using this dump stack just to show the contents of the stack to the screen. You can see here, this is effectively dumping some bytes of the stack to the screen so that we can just see what our commands have actually done. So we've loaded our test value in here. We've then subtracted four from the stack pointer. Remember there's an add i command, but there's no sub i command. So we add minus four here to the stack. And then that has made some new space onto the stack. So then we store our register onto the top of the stack. SWA0 is storing A0 and SP in brackets here means store it onto the stack with an offset of zero. Okay, so we've done that and we can see that result here. Basically, we've got our A0 here of F4, F3, F2, F1. And then we have stored that onto the stop of the stack just here. You can see that has been stored just here. Okay, what we're doing next is we are loading A0 with another value to basically make the point that we have indeed backed up A0. You can see that here, A0 has now been reset to zero and you can see F1, F2, F3, F4 on the top of the stack here. 
We then run a subroutine test, and you can see that down here. This is basically storing the return address onto the top of the stack, and it is loading another test value, 11223344 this time, and it's pushing that onto the stack as well, and it's showing the contents of the stack, and then it's showing the contents of the stack after we've popped it off. Now, this time we're using our macros here. These other macros are described just here, just for um, convenience and neatness, really. So let's have a look at that. And you can see that just here. So we've now loaded A0 with 11223344 here. And we have now pushed F1, F2, F3, F4 before. We've then got the return address for this current running program, which is at 00400048. Of course, it's been reversed because this is Little Indian. You can see the current running program command counter here a few bytes along because, of course, we were in part of a subroutine here. And then we've loaded the a0 and we've pushed that onto the stack 11223344 you can see that just there so our values have been pushed onto the stack there and then when we popped the A0 back off the stack you can see it's still there but now that value has disappeared off the top of the stack now in all cases now of course uh, as usual taking a value off the stack doesn't make it disappear from memory normally it's because my test code is running the uh, modules to show the contents of the stack to the screen and that has erased that value there but you can still see the return address and the F1, F2, F3, F4 there now of course after that we have returned We've restored our return address from the stack and then we've returned and our return, of course, goes here. We're then restoring the original A0 value off the stack here. We're loading it and then we are increasing the stack pointer and then we are showing the contents of the stack. And of course, you can see here now that all of those values have left the stack but the A0 now contains the original value again. So the push and the pop effective commands have backed up and restored the value of A0. And of course our subroutine has correctly returned, even though our dump stack routines will have actually run subroutines. So uh, the, the return address was pr preserved because of us pushing it onto the stack there. So uh, and it's a bit of a pain the way the stack works on RISC-V. I'm not a, a fan of it. I prefer the ARM way of doing things. But um, as long as we use our macros, we can make it a lot more straightforward and we don't have to worry about it so much. So there we go. So the stack point is a little bit weird, but... Um, you know, we can we can work around it. And um, to be fair, uh, at RISC-V, while the stack is much more limited than on the ARM, the ARM instruction set is, I, in my opinion, is not really... You know, it's not really a risk instruction set in the sense of it's very complicated. So um, I, I do um, I do have a lot of respect for Risk Five for maintaining a, a very simple instruction set. And if you look at the way the the bytes of the commands is made up with Risk Five, it's all very neat and straightforward. Whereas if you look at ARM, there's exceptions and subsets and subsets, and some of it's very very confusing. So I'd say it, it's it's one of these things where both have their advantages, and it's just this is the way this one works. Works. So we, we just have to work within that. Of course, when it comes to running subroutines, um, there are a set of rules which I described before of what um, should be preserved and what doesn't need to be. So uh, I guess if we are using this and we are working with the correct registers, this will reduce the amount of pushing and popping we would need to do anyway, because if our subroutine is only changing the parameters that can be changed by the sub and is not changing the ones that it is obliged to back up, then we won't need to push and pop those anyway. So I guess that's one way that we can um, reduce the amount of pushing and popping we need to do because, as I say, we don't have any um, really quick, simple commands to back up and restore lots and lots of registers at the same time. OK, so what we're going to do next is we're going to look at conditions. And again, this is a little bit surprising to me coming from the other um, the processes that I've dealt with. The RISC-V doesn't really have any flags. <laughs> uh, most processes, in fact, basically all processes I dealt with in the past have some kind of flags register. And when we do a mathematical operation, it will set a zero flag or a, um, a negative flag, things like that. And RISC-V doesn't have that. So what we do instead, and I'll be honest, it does seem very logical, what we do instead is our compare command and our branch command are the same command. So what we do is we specify the condition we want to um, test, we specify the two parameters, and we actually specify the branch that we're going to do if the condition is true. So in this case, what we're going to do, we're going to do a branch if equals, comparing A0 and A1, and if they are equals, we're going to jump to 
the module print equals down here. And what I've got here is some really um, cruddy little test routines here, which just show some characters to the screen. We're not going to worry about them, but they're just basically showing if the equals condition occurred or the not equal condition occurred. And then what we've got here is some test variables here that we can just compare. So in this case, we're going to test register A0 compared to A1. And um, you can see here that the sample here they are not equal because A0 is equal to 100 and A1 is equal to 101. So the uh, they aren't equal. So we're expecting print not equals to run here based on this. And um, if we rem remove the rem from this, they will be equal. So the idea, of course, as always, is you go to my website, you download the source code and you test a few different values in here to make sure you understand what's going on. OK, so this is going to be our test. Let's fire it up and let's see what happens. OK, well, you can see here we loaded our two test values. We loaded A0 with 64 here. Uh, that's 100 in, in hexadecimal. And we loaded A1 with 101.65 in hexadecimal. And then we did our comparison. This branch if equals or branch if not equals here. And of course, it was not equal. They don't match. So we've got a, a not equals symbol shown to the screen here. Now, if I just make some changes to this code, if I remove the rem statement from here, a rem is, of course, the hash symbol. If you missed last, last week's episode, the hash symbol is the rem. This, this semicolon here is just so that the colors work on my um, syntax here. So now we are comparing 100 to 100. So we would really hope those come up as equal. To, and you can see A0 and A1 are now the same. And of course, the branch has shown that equal symbol. So um, yeah, that worked as we certainly hoped it would. If that hadn't been true, we would have been in some strange, crazy world where nothing made sense to us. OK, so those are correct. What we're now going to do is we're going to have a look at testing of unsigned numbers. Now, like with a lot of systems, um, we need to treat signed and unsigned numbers differently when we're doing comparisons. A lot of systems, actually, um, the default is unsigned and the commands for signed are special ones. This is kind of the opposite. If we do a branch, if less than equals, it's treated as signed. We actually have to put an U at the end to test if unsigned. Now, we've got a few different options here. We've got branch if less than and branch if greater than. And we've got branch if less than or equals or branch if greater than equals. Of course, the difference being if the two are equal. So we've got some test values here. So for example, here we are testing. We can test here if comparing A1, which is 99, to A0, which is 100. And if we just run this here, so that here we've tested if A0 is greater than or equal A1 to A1 here. So in this case, it's this branch that has been executed. We've compared A0 to A1. A0 is greater than A1. So we have branched to this print greater than equals. And you can see here A0 equals 64 and A1 equals 63. And we've shown that greater than or equal sign there. Now, of course, this would also have occurred if we'd have just done the greater than and the less than, because in this case, they, the two values weren't equal. Now, this time, let's try a value of 101 here. So in this case, we've tested and we've compared 64 to 65. A0 is less than, so we've shown the less than symbol this time. And that's because this condition branch if less than unsigned is the one that is true. So we've tested that here. Now, of course, the um, big difference with this is that when it comes to what would be treated as a negative number. Now, if I do a test and I test a negative number here, well, if we're using the incorrect value and it's an unsigned number, it will actually be treated that as, as a large number. So obviously, in this case, A1 equals minus 101 and A0 equals, equals 100. Now, A1 is less than A0. But in this case, we've actually um, run the command that should have occurred if A0 is less than. Because A1 as an unsigned number is actually very, very large. You see A1 is actually extremely large there. So we've shown the less than symbol. Um, if we wanted to treat that as a signed number, we should have used the signed equivalent versions. Now we can do that. All we need to do here is if we just go to these alternate tests, we can use the regular versions. We can use the signed versions by using alternate commands here. 
So if we go here and have a look at these. So these are the signed versions. You can see that the U is now missing and that's the only difference. So we've got these alternate versions that will work correctly with signed numbers. So if I just use these ones here, as I say, you've got branch if less than and branch if greater than and branch if less than or equals and branch if greater than or equals. In this case, they don't match. So we can, we can just use these ones. So in this case, we're testing the value minus 100 compared to 99 and we are going to branch if less than or branch if greater than. And we've got the two test strings here. And so you can see that A0 is a, actually a very high number, but that's a negative number. And because we're now correctly using the signed comparisons, we are showing that A0 is less than A1 in this case. So that has worked correctly. Again, we do have the branch if greater than and equals or branch if less than equals if we want to do those. So there we go. So we can use both of those as we require. Now, the last set of tests is, of course, comparisons to zero. Now, these are quite interesting. I don't know if you remember what we discussed last week, but the register um, x0, which also has the um, alt alternate alias of zero, is a, a register that is always fixed to the value of zero. So if we want to test something and compare it to zero, we actually compare to the register named zero in this case. So if we want to test if a zero equals zero, which in this example it currently does. So we are testing comparing here and we can do branch if equals a zero to zero or not equal to zero. And zero is of course a register in this case, although a register that can never change. And so in this case, we are showing that a zero does equal zero in this case. Now, if I just change that and I change it so that a zero no longer equals zero. So a zero now equals minus 100. Well, you can see now that um, A0 definitely doesn't equal zero. So, of course, we're showing not equals there. So that's worked correctly. Now, the other thing is, if you prefer, rather than using the zero register, you can actually use um, some alternate aliases and you can um, use branch if equals Z and um, branch if not equals Z. These are um, pseudo ops. Of course, the assembler will actually convert these and use the, that zero register again. But these, of course, do work just fine in the same way. So again, we've got the same result there because we used that term pseudo up there. Now, it is, of course, important to remember this zero register can be used in all cases. If you do need a zero value, you can do that rather than loading zero into a register. You can use that zero register, which is predefined. And you can see that zero register can be, of course, used with any of our comparisons just here. So there we go. So there we go. That's all we're going to be covering today. We've had a look at the stack. We've had a look at the conditions. Next time we're going to go on and we're going to look at a lot of other commands. We're really going to pretty much polish off all of the basic integer commands. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. As I said before, you can go to my website, download the source code and download the development tools and hopefully you can have a go with this yourself. If you've enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. If you like the videos, YouTube recommends them to more people and maybe they'll like them as well. And if you subscribe, it lets me know that people enjoy these videos and it's worth me probably making some more of them because um, I do do a lot of different um, assembly tutorials on a lot of different systems and so the popularity of each does de really decide which ones I decide to make more content on. Anyway, thanks for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Bye now. If you've enjoyed this video today, please consider supporting my content. It takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos. It's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job and it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue Justify doing it essentially. You can back me on Patreon. I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing. You can see one here and also the newest videos. There's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons, although they will all be available to everyone later on. And also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future, what new content to create and things like that. You can see there was recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content. As well as Patreon, you can now become a member of my channel on YouTube. There's a join button you should see just below this video. You can use that. YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon. I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon. It's the same content every week. Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you would like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.